Part One of Chapter Three of Little Eve Edgerton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Eve Edgerton by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. Part One of Chapter Three. What? demanded her father. Altogether unexpectedly, little Eve Edgerton threw back her tousled head and burst out laughing. Oh, father, she jeered, can't you take a joke? I don't know as you ever offered me one before, growled her father a bit ungraciously. All the same, asserted little Eve Edgerton, with sudden seriousness. All the same, father, he did stop breathing twice. And I worked, and I worked, and I worked over him. Slowly, her great eyes widened. And, oh, father, his skin, she whispered simply. Hush, snapped her father with a great gust of resentment that he took to be a gust of propriety. Hush, I say. I tell you it isn't delicate for a, for a girl to talk about a man's skin. Oh, but his skin was very delicate, mused little Eve Edgerton persistently. There in the lantern light. What lantern light? demanded her father. And the moonlight, murmured little Eve Edgerton. What moonlight? demanded her father. A trifle quizzically, he stepped forward and peered into his daughter's face. Personally, Eve, he said, I don't care for the young man, and I certainly don't wish to hear anything about his skin. Not anything. Do you understand? I'm very glad you saved his life he hastened to affirm. It was very commendable of you, I'm sure, and someone, doubtless, will be very much relieved. But for me, personally, the incident is closed. Closed, I said. Do you understand? Brusquely, he turned back toward his own room, and then swung around again suddenly in the doorway. Eve, he frowned. That was a joke, wasn't it? What you said about wanting to keep that young man? "'Why, of course,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'Well, I must say, it was an exceedingly clumsy one,' growled her father irritably. "'Maybe so,' droned little Eve Edgerton with unruffled serenity. "'It was the first joke, you see, that I ever made.' Slowly again her eyes began to widen. "'All the same, father,' she said, "'his—' "'Hush!' he ordered, and slammed the door conclusively behind him. Very thoughtfully for a moment, little Eve Edgerton kept right on standing there in the middle of the room. In her eyes was just the faintest possible suggestion of a smile, but there was no smile whatsoever about her lips. Her lips, indeed, were quite drawn and most flagrantly set with the expression of one who, having something determinate to say, will yet say it, somewhere, sometime, somehow, though the skies fall and all the waters of the earth dry up. Then, like the dart of a bird, she flashed to her father's door and opened it. Father, she whispered. Father. Yes, answered the huff-muffled, pillowy voice. What is it? Oh, I forgot to tell you something that happened once, down in Indochina, whispered little Eve Edgerton. Once you were away, she confided breathlessly, I pulled a half-drowned coolie out of a canal. Well, what of it? asked her father a bit tartly. Oh, nothing special, said little Eve Edgerton, except that his skin was like yellow parchment and sandpaper and old plaster. Without further ado, then, she turned away and except for the single ecstatic episode of making the four hundred muffins for breakfast, resumed her pulseless role of being just little Eve Edgerton. As for Barton, the subsequent morning hours brought sleep and sleep only. The sort of sleep that fairly souses the senses in oblivion, weighing the limbs with lead, the brain with stupor, till the sleeper rolls out from under the load at last, like one half paralyzed with cramp and helplessness. Certainly it was long after noontime before Barton actually rallied his aching bones, his dizzy head, his refractory inclinations, to meet the fluctuant sympathy and shaft that awaited him downstairs 
in every nook and corner of the great idle-minded hotel. Conscientiously, but without enthusiasm, from the temporary retreat of the men's waiting-room, he sent up his card at last to Mr. Edgerton, and was duly informed that that gentleman and his daughter were mountain-climbing. In an absurd flare of disappointment, then, he edged his way out through the prattling piazza groups to the shouting tennis players, and on from the shouting tennis players to the teasing golfers, and back from the teasing golfers to the peaceful writing-room, where in a great lazy chair by the open window he settled down once more, with unwanted morbidness, to brood over the grimly bizarre happenings of the previous night. In a soft blur of sound and sense the names of other people came wafting to him from time to time, and once or twice at least the word Barton shrilled out at him with astonishing poignancy. Still like a man half-drugged, he dozed again, and woke in a vague sweating terror, and dozed again, and dreamed again, and roused himself at last with the one violent determination to hook his sleeping consciousness, whether or no, into the nearest conversation that he could reach. The conversation going on at the moment just outside his window was not a particularly interesting one to hook one's attention into, but at least it was fairly distinct. In blissfully rational human voices, two unknown men were discussing the non-domesticity of the modern woman. It was not an erudite discussion, but just a mere personal complaint. I had a house, wailed one. The nicest, coziest house you ever saw. We were two years building it, and there was a garden. A real Jim Dandy flower and vegetable garden. And there were twenty-seven fruit trees. But my wife, the whale deepened, my wife, she just would live in a hotel. Couldn't stand the strain, she said, of planting food three times a day. Not couldn't stand the strain of earning meals three times a day, you understand, the wailing voice said significantly but couldn't stand the strain of ordering them. People all around you, you know, starving to death for just bread, but she couldn't stand the strain of having to decide between squab and tenderloin, eh? Oh, Lordy, you can't tell me anything, snapped the other voice more incisively. Houses. I've had four. First it was the cellar my wife wanted to eliminate. Then it was the attic. Then it was... We're living in an apartment now, he finished abruptly. An apartment, mind you, one of those blankety, blank, blank, blank apartments. Hmm, <clears throat> wailed the first voice again. There's hardly a woman you meet these days who hasn't got rouge on her cheeks. But a man's got to go back to generations, I guess, if he wants to find one that's got any flower on her nose. Flower on her nose, interrupted the sharper voice flower on her nose oh ye gods i don't believe there's a woman in this whole hotel who'd no flower if she saw it women don't care any more i tell you they don't care just as a mere bit of physical stimulus the crescendous stridency of the speech roused barton to a lazy smile then altogether unexpectedly across indifference across drowsiness across absolute physical and mental non-concern the idea behind the speech came hurtling to him and started him bolt upright in his chair. Ha, huh, he thought, I know a girl that cares. From head to foot a sudden warm sense of satisfaction glowed through him, a throb of pride, a puffiness of the chest. Ha, huh, he gloated. Then interruptingly from outside the window he heard the click of chairs hitching a bit nearer together. Psst! whispered a voice. Who's the freak in the 1830s clothes? Why, that's the little Edgerton girl, piped the other voice cautiously. It isn't so much the 1830 clothes as the 1830 expression that gets me. Where in creation? Oh, upon my soul, groaned the man whose wife would live in a hotel. Oh, upon my soul, if there's one thing that I can't stand, it's a woman who hasn't any style. If I had my way, he, thre he threatened with hissing emphasis, if I had my way, I tell you, I'd have every homely-looking woman in the world put out of her misery. Put out of my misery is what I mean. Ha, 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 chuckled the other voice. Ha, 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 gibbed both voices ecstatically together. With quite unnecessary haste, Barton sprang to the window and looked out. 
It was Eve Edgerton, and she did look funny. Not especially funny, but just plain, everyday little Eve Edgerton. Funny in a shabby old English trapping suit, with a knapsack slung askew across one shoulder, a faded alpine hat yanked down across her eyes, and one steel-wristed little hand dragging a mountain laurel bush almost as big as herself. Close behind her followed her father, equally shabby, his shapeless pockets fairly bulging with rocks, a battered tin botany kit in one hand, a dingy black camera box in the other. Impulsively, Barton started out to meet them, but just a step from the threshold of the piazza door, he sensed for the first time the long line of smokers watching the two figures grinningly above their puffy brown pipes and cigars. "'What is it?' called one smoker to another. "'Moving day in jungle town?' "'Ha, ha, ha!' teetered the whole line of smokers. "'Ha, ha, ha, ha!' "'So because he belonged, not so much to the type of person that can't stand having its friends laughed at, as to the type that can't stand having friends who are liable to be laughed at, Barton changed his mind, quite precipitately, about identifying himself at that particular moment with the Edgerton family.' and whirled back instead to the writing room. There, by the aid of the hotel clerk and two bellboys, and three new blotters and a different pen, and an entirely fresh bottle of ink, and just exactly the right sized, the right tinted sort of letter paper, he concocted a perfectly charming note to little Eve Edgerton, a note full of compliment, of gratitude, of sincere appreciation, reiterating even once more his persistent intention of rendering her somewhere, sometime, a really significant service. Whereupon, thus duly relieved of his truly honest effort at self-expression, he went back again to his own kind, to the prattling, the well-groomed, the ultra-fashionables of both mind and body. And there on the shining tennis courts and the soft golf greens, through the late yellow afternoon and the first gray thread of twilight, the old sickening ennui came creeping back to his senses, warring chaotically there with the natural nervous reaction of his rec recent adventure, till just out of sheer morbid unrest, as soon as the flower-scented candle-lighted dinner hour was over, he went stalking round and round the interminable piazzas, hunting in every dark corner for Mr. Edgerton and his daughter. Meeting them abruptly at last in the full glare of the office, he clutched fatuously at Mr. Edgerton's reluctant attention with some quick question about the extraordinary moonlight, and stood by, grinning like any bashful schoolboy, while Mr. Edgerton explained to him severely, as if it were his fault, just why and to what extent the radi of mountain moonlight differed from the radi of any other kind of moonlight, and Eve herself, in absolute spiritual remoteness, stood patiently, shifting her weight from one foot to the other, staring abstractedly all the time at the floor under her feet. Right into the midst of this instructive discourse broke one of Barton's men-friends with a sharp jog of his elbow and a brief apologetic nod to the Edgertons. "'Oh, I say, Barton!' cried the newcomer breathlessly. "'That wedding, you know, over across at the Kentons to-night, with the Viennese orchestra, and heaven knows what from New York. Well!' We've shanghaied the whole business for a dance here tomorrow night. Music, flowers, palms, catering, everything. It's going to be the biggest little dancing party that this slice of North American scenery ever saw. And... Slowly, little Eve Edgerton lifted her great solemn eyes to the newcomer's face. A party? she drawled. A... a dancing party? You mean a real Christian dancing party? Dully the big eyes drooped again, and as if in mere casual mannerism, her little brown hands went creeping up to the white breast of her gown, then just as startling, just as unprovable as the flash of a shooting star, her glance flashed up at Barton. "'Oh!' gasped little Eve Edgerton. "'Oh!' said Barton. Astoundingly, in his ears, bells seemed suddenly to be ringing. His head was a whirl, his pulses fairly pounding with the weird, quixotic purport of his impulse. "'Miss Edgerton,' he began. "'Miss—' Then right behind him two older men joggled him awkwardly in passing. "'And that Miss Von Eden chuckled one man to another. "'Lordy, there'll be more than forty men after her for tomorrow night. 
Smith, Arnold, Hudson, Hazelton, who are you betting will get her? I'm betting that I will, crashed every brutally competitive male instinct in Barton's body. Impetuously he broke away from the Edgertons and darted off to find Miss Von Eden before Smith, Arnold, Hudson, Hazelton, or any other man should find her. So he sent little Eve Edgerton a great gorgeous box of candy instead, wonderful candy, pounds and pounds of it, fine fluted chocolates and pink rose bonbons and fat sugared violets and all sorts of tin foiled mysteries of fruit and spice. And when the night of the party came, he strutted triumphantly to it with Helen von Eaton, who already at twenty was beginning to be just a little bit bored with parties, and together through all that riot of music and flowers and rainbow colors and dazzling lights, they trotted and tangoed with monotonous perfection, the envied and admired of all beholders, two superbly physical young specimens of manhood and womanhood, desperately condoning each other's dullness for the sake of each other's good looks. And while youth and its laughter, a chaos of color and shrill crescendos, was surging back and forth across the flower-wreathed piazzas, and violins were wheedling, and Japanese lanterns drunk with candlelight were bobbing gaily in the balsam-scented breeze, little Eve Edgerton, upstairs in her own room, was kneeling crampishly on the floor by the open window, with her chin on the window sill, staring quizzically down, down on all that joy and novelty, till her father called her a trifle impatiently at last from his microscope table on the other side of the room. Eve, summoned her father, what an idler you are! Can't you see how worried I am over this specimen here? My eyes, I tell you, aren't what they used to be. Then patiently little Eve Edgerton scrambled to her feet and crossed over to her father's table, pushed his head mechanically aside, and, bending down, squinted her own eyes close to his magnifying glass. Bell-shaped calyx, she began, Five petals of the corollary partly united. Why, it must be some relation to the Mexican rain tree, she mumbled without enthusiasm. Leaves alternate, bipinate, very typically, few foliate, she continued. Why, it's a, a pithacolumbium. Sure enough, said Edgerton, that's what I thought all the time. As one eminently relieved of all future worry in the matter, he jumped up pushed away his microscopic work, and grabbing up the biggest book on the table, bolted unceremoniously for an easy chair. Indifferently, for a moment, little Eve Edgerton stood watching him. Then heavily, like a sleepy, insistent puppy-dog, she shambled across the room and, climbing up into her father's lap, shoved aside her father's book, and burrowed her head triumphantly back into the lean, bony curve of his shoulder. Her whole yawning interest centered apparently in the toes of her father's slippers. Then, so quietly that it scarcely seemed abrupt, Father, she asked, was my mother beautiful? What? gasped Edgerton. What? bristling with a grave sort of astonishment. He reached up nervously and stroked his daughter's hair. Your mother, he winced. Your mother was, to me, the most beautiful woman that ever lived. Such expression, he glowed, such fire, but of such a spiritual modesty, of such a physical delicacy, like a rose, he mused. Like a rose that should refuse to bloom for any but the hand that gathered it. Languorously, from some good practical pocket, little Eve Edgerton extracted a much befrilled chocolate bonbon and sat there munching it with extreme thoughtfulness. Then, father she whispered i wish i was like mother why asked edgerton wincing because mother's dead she answered simply noisily like an overconscious throat the tiny traveling clock on the mantelpiece began to swallow its moments one moment two moments three four five six moments seven moments on, 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 gutturally, laboriously, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, even twenty, with the girl still nibbling at her chocolate, and the man still staring off into space, 
with that strange little whimper of pain between his pale, shrewd eyes. It was the man who broke the silence first. Precipitately he shifted his knees and jostled his daughter to her feet. Eve, he said, you're awfully spleeny tonight. I'm going to bed. And he stalked off into his own room, slamming the door behind him. Once again, from the middle of the floor, little Eve Edgerton stood staring blankly after her father. Then she dawdled across the room and opened his door just wide enough to come past the corners of her mouth. Father, she whispered, did mother know that she was a rose before you were clever enough to find her? No, faltered her father's husky voice. That was the miracle of it. She never even dreamed that she was a rose until I found her. Very quietly, little Eve Edgerton shut the door again and came back into the middle of her room and stood there hesitatingly for an instant. Then quite abruptly she crossed to her bureau and pushing aside the old ivory toilet articles began to jerk her tously hair first one way and then another across her worried forehead. But if you knew you were a rose, she mused perplexedly to herself, that is, if you felt almost sure that you were, she added with sudden humility, that is, she corrected herself, that is, if you felt almost sure that you could be a rose, if anybody wanted you to be one. In impulsive experimentation she gave another tweak to her hair and pinched a poor bruised-looking little blush into the hollow of one thin little cheek. But suppose it was the, the people going by, she faltered, who never even dreamed that you were a rose. Suppose it was the... Suppose it was... Suppose... Dejection, unspeakable, settled suddenly upon her, an agonizing sense of youth's futility. Rackingly above the crash and lilt of music, the quick wild thud of dancing feet, the sharp staccato notes of laughter, she heard the dull, heavy, unrhythmical tread of the oncoming years, gray years, limping eternally from tomorrow on through unloved lands on unloved errands. This is the end of youth. It is, it is, it is, whimpered her heart. It isn't something suddenly poignant and determinate shrilled startlingly in her brain. I'll have one more peep at youth anyway, threatened the brain. If we only could, yearned the discouraged heart. Speculatively, for one brief instant, the girl stood cocking her head toward the door of her father's room. Then expeditiously, if not fashionably, she began to at once to rearrange her tousled hair, and after one single pat to her gown, surely the quickest toilet-making of that festive evening, she snatched up a slipper in each hand, crept safely past her father's door, crept safely out at last through her own door into the hall, and still carrying a slipper in each hand, had reached the head of the stairs before a new complexity assailed her. Why, why, I've never yet been anywhere alone without my mother's memory, she faltered aghast. Then impetuously, with a little frown of material inconvenience, but no flicker whatsoever in the fixed spiritual habit of her life, she dropped her slippers on the floor, sped back to her room, hesitated on the threshold a moment with real perplexity, darted softly to her trunk, rummaged as noiselessly through it as a kitten's paws, discovered at last a special object of her quest, a filmy square of old linen and lace, thrust it into her belt with her own handkerchief, and went creeping back again to her slippers at the head of the stairs. As if to add fresh nervousness to the situation, one of the slippers lay pointing quite boldly downstairs, but the other slipper, true as a compass to the north, towed with unmistakable severity toward the bedroom. Tentatively, little Eve Edgerton inserted one foot in the timid slipper. The path back to her room was certainly the simplest path that she knew, and the dullest. Equally tentatively, she withdrew from the timid slipper and tried the adventurous one. Ouch! she cried out loud. The sole of the second slipper seemed fairly sizzling with excitement. With a slight gasp of impatience, then she reached out and pulled the timid slipper back into line, stepped firmly into it, pointed both slipper toes unswervingly southward, 
and proceeded on downstairs to investigate the Christian dance. At the first turn of the lower landing she stopped short, with every ennui darkened sense in her body jacked like a wild deer's senses before the sudden dazzle of sight, sound, scent that awaited her below. Before her blinking eyes she saw even the empty humdrum hotel office turned into a blazing bower of palms and roses and electric lights. Beyond this bower a corridor opened out more dense, more sweet, more sparkling, and across this corridor the echo of the unseen ball came diffusing through the palms, the plaintive cry of a violin, the rippling laugh of a piano, the swarming hum of human voices, the swish of skirts, the agitant thud, thud, thud of dancing feet, the throb almost of young hearts, a thousand commonplace everyday sounds merged here and now into one magic harmony that thrilled little Eve Edgerton as nothing on God's big earth had ever thrilled her before. Hurriedly she darted down the last flight of steps and sped across the bright office to the dark veranda, consumed by one fuming, passionate, utterly uncontrollable curiosity to see with her own eyes just what all that wonderful sound looked like. End of Part 1, Chapter 3「Chapter Three of Little Eve Edgerton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Eve Edgerton by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. Part Two of Chapter Three. Once outside in the darkness, her confusion cleared a little. It was late, she reasoned, very, very late, long after midnight, probably, for of all the shadowy, flickering line of evening smokers that usually crowded that particular stretch of veranda, only a single distant glow or two remained. Yet even now, in the almost complete isolation of her surroundings, the old inherent bashfulness swept over her again and warred chaotically with her insistent purpose. As stealthily as possible, she crept along the dark wall to the one bright spot that flared forth like a lantern lens from the gay ballroom. Crept along, crept along, a plain little girl in a plain little dress, yearning like all the other plain little girls of the world, in all the other plain little dresses of the world, to press her wistful little nose just once against some dazzling toy shop window. With her fingers groping at last into the actual shutters of that coveted ballroom window, she scrunched her eyes up perfectly tight for an instant, and then opened them, staring wide at the entrancing scene before her. Oh, said little Eve Edgerton. Oh. The scene was certainly the scene of a most madcap summer carnival. Palms of the far December desert were there and roses from the near-familiar August gardens. The swirl of chiffon and lace and silk was like a rainbow-tinted breeze. The music crashed on the senses like blows that wasted no breath in subtler argument. Naked shoulders gleamed at every turn beneath their diamonds. Silk stockings bared their sheen at each new, rompish step. And through the dizzy mystery of it all, the haze, the maze, the vague, audacious unreality, grimly conventional, blatantly tangible white shirt fronts surrounded by great black dots of men, went slapping by, each with its share of fairyland in its arms. "'Why, they're not dancing,' gasped little Eve Edgerton. "'They're just prancing.' Even so, her own feet began to prance, and very faintly across her cheekbones a little flicker of pink began to glow. Then, very startlingly, behind her a man's shadow darkened suddenly, and sensing instantly that this newcomer also was interested in the view through the window, she drew aside courteously to give him his share of the pleasure. In her briefest glance she saw that he was no one whom she knew, but in the throbbing witchery of the moment he seemed to her suddenly like her only friend in the world. "'It's pretty, isn't it?' 
She nodded toward the ballroom. Casually the man bent down to look until his smoke-scented cheek almost grazed hers. It certainly is, he conceded amiably. Without further speech for a moment, they both stood there, peering into the wonderful picture. Then altogether abruptly, and with no excuse whatsoever, little Eve Edgerton's heart gave a great big lurch, and wringing her small brown hands together, so that by no grave mischance should she reach out and touch the stranger's sleeve as she peered up at him. "'I can dance,' drawled little Eve Edgerton. Shrewdly the man's glance flashed down at her. Quite plainly he recognized her now. She was that funny little Edgerton girl. That's exactly who she was. In the simple old-fashioned arrangement of her hair, in the personal neatness but total indifference to fashion of her prim, high-throated gown, she represented, frankly, everything that he thought he most approved in woman. But nothing under the starry heavens at that moment could have forced him to lead her as a partner into that dazzling maelstrom of mode and modernity because she looked so horridly eccentric and conspicuous compared to the girls that he thought he didn't approve of at all. "'Why, of course you can dance. I only wish I could,' he lied gallantly, and stole away as soon as he reasonably could to find another partner, trusting devoutly that the darkness had not divulged his actual features. Five minutes later, through the window frame of her magic picture, little Eve Edgerton saw him pass, swinging his share of fairyland in his arms. And close behind him followed Barton, swinging his share of fairyland in his arms. Barton the Wonderful at his best. Barton the Wonderful with his best, the blonde, blonde girl of the marvelous gowns and hats. There was absolutely no doubt whatsoever about them. They were the handsomest couple in the room. Furtively from her hidden corner, little Eve Edgerton stood and watched them. To her appraising eyes, there were at least two other girls almost as beautiful as Barton's partner. But no other man in the room compared with Barton. Of that she was perfectly sure. His brow, his eyes, his chin, the way he held his head upon his wonderful shoulders, the way he stood upon his feet, his smile, his laugh, the very gesture of his hands. Over and over again as she watched, these two perfect partners came circling through her vision, solemnly graceful or rhythmically hoydenish, two fortune-favored youngsters born into exactly the same sphere, trained to do exactly the same things in exactly the same way, so that even now, with twelve years' difference in age between them, every conscious vibration of their beings seemed to be tuned instinctively to the same key. Bluntly, little Eve Edgerton looked back upon the odd, haphazard training of her own life. Was there anyone in this world whose training had been exactly like hers? Then suddenly her elbow went crooking up across her eyes to remember how Barton had looked in the stormy woods that night, lying half-naked and almost wholly dead at her feet. Except for her odd, haphazard training, he would have been dead. Barton the beautiful, dead, and worse than dead, buried, and worse than... Out of her lips a little gasp of sound rang agonizingly. And in that instant, by some trick fashion of the dance, the rollicking music stopped right off short in the middle of a note. The lights went out, the dancers fled precipitously to their seats, and out of the arbored gallery of the orchestra a single swarthy-faced male singer stepped forth into the wan wake of an artificial moon and lifted up a marvelous tenor voice in one of those weird folk songs of the far away that fairly tear the listener's heart out of his body, a song as sinisterly metallic as the hum of hate along a dagger blade, a song as rapturously surprised at its own divinity as the first trill of a nightingale, a song of purling brooks and green gray mountain fortresses, a song of quick sharp lights and long low lazy cadences, a song of love and hate, 
a song of all joys and all sorrows. And then death, the song of sex as nature sings it, the plaintive, wheedling, passionate song of sex as nature sings it yet in the faraway places of the earth. To no one else in that company probably did a single word penetrate. Merely stricken dumb by the vibrant power of the voice, vaguely uneasy, vaguely saddened, group after group of hoydenish youngsters huddled in speechless fascination around the dark edges of the hall. But to little Eve Edgerton's cosmopolitan ears, each familiar gypsyish word thus strangely transplanted into that alien room was like a call to the wild, from the wild. So, as to all repressed natures, the amount of self-expression comes once, without warning, without preparation, without even conscious acquiescence sometimes. The moment came to little Eve Edgerton. Impishly first, more as a dare to herself than as anything else, she began to hum the melody and sway her body softly to and fro to the rhythm. Then suddenly her breath began to quicken, and as one half hypnotized, she went clambering through the window into the ballroom, stood for an instant like a grey-white phantom in the outer windows, then, with a laugh as foreign to her own ears as to another, snatched up a great, square, shimmering silver scarf that gleamed across a deserted chair, stretched it taut by its corners across her hair and eyes, and with a queer little cry, half defiance, half appeal, a quick dart, a long undulating glide, merged herself into the dagger-blade, the nightingale, the grim mountain fortress, the gay mocking brook, all the love, all the rapture, all the ghastly fatalism of that heartbreaking song. Bent as a bow, her lithe figure curved now right, now left, to the lilting cadence. Supple as a silken tube, her slender body seemed to drink up the fluid sound. No one could have sworn in that vague light that her feet even so much as touched the ground. She was a wraith, a fantasy, a fluctuant miracle of sound and sense. Tremulously the singer's voice faltered in his throat to watch his song come gray ghost true before his staring eyes. With scant restraint, the crowd along the walls pressed forward, half pleasure mad, to solve the mystery of the apparition. Abruptly the song stopped, the dancer faltered, lights blazed. A veritable shriek of applause went roaring to the rooftops. And little Eve Edgerton, in one wild, panic-stricken surge of terror, went tearing off through a blind alley of palms, dodging a café table, jumping an improvised trellis, a hundred pursuing voices yelling, Where is she? Where is she? The tell-tale tinsel scarf flapping frenziedly behind her, flapping, flapping, till at last between one high-garnished shelf and another it twined its vampirish chiffon around the delicate fronds of a huge potted fern. There was a jerk, a blur, a blow, the sickening crash of fallen pottery, and little Eve Edgerton crumpled up on the floor, no longer colorless, among the pale, dry, rainbow tints and shrill metallic glints of that most wondrous scene. Under her crimson mask, when the rescuers finally reached her, she lay as perfectly disguised as even her most bashful mood could have wished. All around her, kneeling, crowding, meddling, interfering, frightened people queried, Who is she? Who is she? Now and again, from out of the medley, someone offered a half-articulate suggestion. It was the hotel proprietor who moved first. Clumsily but kindly, with a fat hand thrust under her shoulders, he tried to raise her head from the floor. Barton himself, as the most recently returned from the dark valley, moved next. Futilely, with a tiny wisp of linen and lace that he found at the girl's belt, he tried to wipe the blood from her lips. Who is she? Who is she? The conglomerate hum of inquiry rose and fell like a moan. Beneath the crimson stain on the little lace handkerchief, a trace of indelible ink showed faintly. 
Scowlingly, Barton bent to decipher it. Mother's little handkerchief, the marking read. Mother's? Barton repeated blankly. Then suddenly full comprehension broke upon him, and, horridly startled and shocked with a brand new realization of the tragedy, he fairly blurted out his astonishing information. Why, why, it's the little Edgerton girl, he hurled like a bombshell into the surrounding company. Instantly, with the mystery once removed, a dozen hysterical people seemed startled into normal activity. No one knew exactly what to do, but some ran for water and towels, and some ran for the doctor, and one young woman with astonishing acumen slipped out of her silk-white petticoat and bound it, blue ribbons and all, as best she could, around Eve Edgerton's poor little gashed head. "'We must carry her upstairs,' asserted the hotel proprietor. "'I'll carry her,' said Barton, quite definitely. Fantastically, the procession started upward. Little Eve Edgerton, white as a ghost now in Barton's arms, except for that one persistent trickle of red, from under the loosening edge of her huge oriental-like turban of ribbon and petticoat, the hotel proprietor still worrying eternally how to explain everything, two or three well-intentioned women babbling inconsequently of other broken heads. In astonishingly slow response to as violent a knock as they thought they gave, if Edgerton's father came shuffling at last to the door to greet them, like one half paralyzed with sleep and perplexity, he stood staring blankly at them as they filed into his rooms with their burden. "'Your daughter seems to have bumped her head,' the hotel proprietor began with professional tact. In one gasping breath, the women started to explain their version of the accident. Barton, as dumb as the father, carried the girl directly over to the bed and put her down softly, half lying, half sitting, among the great pile of night-crumpled pillows. Some one threw a blanket over her. And above the top edge of that blanket, nothing of her showed, except the grotesquely twisted turban, the whole of one white eyelid, the half of the other, and just that single persistent trickle of red. Rapishly at that moment, the clock on the mantelpiece choked out the hour of three. Already dawn was more than half a hint in the sky, and in the ghastly mixture of real and artificial light, the girl's doom looked already sealed. Then very suddenly she opened her eyes and stared around. "'Eve!' gasped her father. "'What have you been doing?' Vaguely the troubled eyes closed and then opened again. "'I was trying to show people that I was a rose.' mumbled little Eve Edgerton. Swiftly her father came running to her side. He thought it was her deathbed statement. But Eve, he pleaded, why, my own little girl, why, my... Laboriously the big eyes lifted to his. Mother was a rose, persisted the stricken lips desperately. Yes, I know, sobbed her father, but, but... But nothing, mumbled little Eve Edgerton. With an almost superhuman effort, she pushed her sharp little chin across the confining edge of the blanket. Vaguely, unrecognizingly then, for the first time, her heavy eyes sensed the hotel proprietor's presence and worried their way across the tearful ladies to Barton's harrowed face. Mother was a rose, she began all over again. Mother was a rose. Mother was a rose, she persisted babblingly, and father g guessed it from the very first. But as for me, weakly she began to claw at her incongruous bandage. But as for me, she gasped, the way I'm fixed, I have to announce it. End of Part 2 Chapter 3「Part One, Chapter Four of Little Eve Edgerton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Little Eve Edgerton by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott Part 1 Chapter 4 The Edgertons did not start for Melbourne the following day, nor the next, nor the next, nor even the next. In a head bandage much more scientific than a blue ribboned petticoat, but infinitely less decorative, little Eve Edgerton lay imprisoned among her hotel pillows. Twice a day, and oftener if he could justify it, the village doctor came to investigate pulse and temperature. Never before in all his humdrum winter experience, or occasional summer tourist vagary, had he ever met any people who prated of camels instead of motor-cars, or deprecated the dust of Abyssinia on their Piccadilly shoes, or sighed indiscriminately for the snow-tinted breezes of the Klondike and Ceylon? Never, either, in all his full round of experience, had the village doctor had a surgical patient as serenely complacent as little Eve Edgerton or any anxious relative as madly restive as little Eve Edgerton's father. For the first twenty-four hours, of course, Mr. Edgerton was much too worried over the accident to his daughter to think for a moment of the accident to his railway and steamship tickets. For the second twenty-four hours he was very naturally so much concerned with the readjustment of his railway and steamship tickets that he never concerned himself at all with the accident to his plans. By the end of the third twenty-four hours, with his first two worries reasonably eliminated, it was the accident to his plans that smote upon him with the fiercest poignancy. Let a man's clothes and togs vacillate as they will between his trunk and his bureau. Once that man's spirit is packed for a journey, nothing but journey's end can ever unpack it again. With his own heart tuned already to the heart-throb of an engine, his pale eyes focused squintingly toward expected novelties, his thin nostrils half a sniff with the first salty scent of the far away, Mr. Edgerton, whatever his intentions, was not the most ideal of sick-room companions. Too conscientious to leave his daughter, too unhappy to stay with her, he spent the larger part of his days and nights pacing up and down like a caged beast between the two bedrooms. It was not till the fifth day, however, that his impatience actually burst the bounds he had set for it. Somewhere between his maple bureau and Eve's mahogany bed, the actual explosion took place, and in that explosion every single infinitesimal wrinkle of brow, cheek, chin, nose, was called into play, as if here at last was a man who intended once and for all to wring his face perfectly dry of all human expression. Eve, heased her father, I hate this place. I loathe this place. I abominate it. I despise it. The flora is execrable. The fauna, nil. And as to the coffee, the breakfast coffee. Oh, ye gods, Eve, if we are delayed here another week, I shall die die, mind you, at sixty-two, with my life-work just begun, Eve. I hate this place. I abominate it. I de— Really, mused little Eve Edgerton from her white pillows. Why, I think it's lovely. Eh? demanded her father. What? It's so social, said little Eve Edgerton. Social? choked her father. As bereft of expression as if robbed of both inner and outer vision, little Eve Edgerton lifted her eyes to his. "'Why, two of the hotel ladies have almost been to see me,' she confided listlessly, and the chambermaid brought me the picture of her beau, and the hotel proprietor lent me a storybook, and Mr. Social,' snapped her father. Oh, of course, if you got killed in a fire or anything, saving people's lives, you'd sort of expect them to send you candy or make you some sort of a memorial, conceded little Eve Edgerton unemotionally. But when you break your head just amusing yourself, why, I thought it was nice for the hotel ladies to almost come to see me, she finished without even so much as a flicker of the eyelids. 
Disgustedly, her father started for his own room, then whirled abruptly in his tracks and glanced back at that imperturbable little figure in the big white bed. Except for the scarcely perceptible hound-like flicker of his nostrils, his own face held not a whit more expression than the girl's. Eve, he asked casually, Eve, you're not changing your mind, are you, about Nuncanono and John Elbertson? Good old John Elbertson, he repeated feelingly. Eve, he quickened with sudden sharpness, surely nothing has happened to make you change your mind about Nuncanono and good old John Elbertson? Oh, no, father, said little Eve Edgerton. Indolently, she withdrew her eyes from her father's and stared off Nuncanono ward in a hazy geographical sort of a dream. Good old John Albertson. Good old John Albertson, she began to croon very softly to herself. Good old John Albertson, how I do love his kind brown eyes. How I do... Brown eyes, snapped her father. Brown, John Albertson's got the grayest eyes that I ever saw in my life. Without the slightest ruffle of composure, little Eve Edgerton accepted the correction. Oh, has he? she conceded amiably. Well, then, good old John Albertson, good old John Albertson, how I do love his kind gray eyes, she began all over again. Palpably Edgerton shifted his standing weight from one foot to the other. I understood your mother, he asserted a bit defiantly. Did you, dear? I wonder, mused little Eve Edgerton. Eh? jerked her father. Still with a vague geographical dream in her eyes, little Eve Edgerton pointed off suddenly toward the open lid of her steamer trunk. Oh, my manuscript notes, father, please, she ordered almost peremptorily. John's notes, you know, I might as well be working on them while I'm lying here. Obediently from the tuzzled top of the steamer trunk, her father returned with a great batch of rough manuscript. And my pencil, please, persisted Lily Edgerton. And my eraser, and my writing board, and my ruler, and my... Absent-mindedly, one by one, Edgerton handed the articles to her and then sank down on the foot of her bed with his thin-lipped mouth contorted into a rather mirthless grin. "'Don't care much for your old father, do you?' he asked, trenchantly. Gravely for a moment, the girl sat studying her father's weather-beaten features. The thin hair, the pale shrewd eyes, the gaunt cheeks, the indomitable old young mouth. Then a little shy smile flickered across her face and was gone again. "'As a parent, dear,' she drawled, "'I love you to distraction, but as a daily companion?' Vaguely her eyebrows lifted. As a real playmate? Against the starch white of her pillows, the sudden flutter of her small brown throat showed with almost startling distinctness. But as a real playmate, she persisted evenly, you're so intelligent and you travel so fast, it tires me. Whom do you like? asked her father sharply. The girl's eyes were suddenly sullen again, bored, distrait, inestimably dreary. That's the whole trouble, she said. You've never given me time to like anybody. Oh, but Eve, pleaded her father. Awkward as any schoolboy, he sat there fuming and twisting before this absurd little bunch of nerve and nerves that he himself had begotten. Oh, but Eve, he deprecated helplessly, it's the deuce of a job for a for a man to be left all alone in the world with a with a daughter really it is already the sweat had started on his forehead and across one cheek the old gray fretwork of wrinkles began to shadow suddenly i've done my best he pleaded i swear i have only i've never known how with a mother now he stammered with a wife with a sister with your best friend's sister you know just what to do. It's a definite relation, prescribed by a definite emotion. But a daughter, oh ye gods, your whole sexual angle of vision changed. A creature neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. Non-superior, 
non-contemporaneous, non-subservient, just a lady, a strange lady. Yes, that's exactly it, Eve, a strange lady, growing eternally just a little bit more strange, just a little bit more remote every minute of her life. Yet it's so damned intimate all the time, he blurted out passionately, all the time she's rowing you about your manners and your morals, all the time she's laying down the law to you about the tariff or the turnips. You're remembering how you used to scrub her in her first little blue-lined tin bathtub. Once again the flickering smile flared up in little Eve Edgerton's eyes and was gone again. A trifle self-consciously she burrowed back into her pillows. When she spoke her voice was scarcely audible. Oh, I know I'm funny, she admitted conscientiously. You're not funny, snapped her father. Yes, I am, whispered the girl. No, you're not, reasserted her father with increasing vehemence. You're not. It's I who am funny. It's I who... In a chaos of emotion, he slid along the edge of the bed and clasped her in his arms. Just for an instant, his wet cheek grazed hers. Then, all the same, you know, he insisted awkwardly, I hate this place. Surprisingly, little Eve Edgerton reached up and kissed him full on the mouth. They were both very much embarrassed. Why, why, Eve, stammered her father. Why, my little, little girl, why, you haven't kissed me before since you were a baby. Yes, I have, nodded little Eve Edgerton. No, you haven't, snapped her father. Yes, I have, insisted Eve. Tighter and tighter, their arms clasped around each other. You're all I've got, faltered the man brokenly. You're all I've ever had whispered little Eve Edgerton. Silently for a moment, each according to his thoughts, sat staring off into far places. Then, without any warning whatsoever, the man reached out suddenly and tipped his daughter's face up abruptly into the light. Eve, he demanded, surely you're not blaming me any in your heart because I want to see you safely married and settled with... with John Albertson? Vaguely, like a child repeating a dimly understood lesson, little Eve Edgerton repeated the phrases after him. Oh, no, father, she said, I surely am not blaming you in my heart for wanting to see me married and settled with John Albertson. Good old John Albertson, she corrected painstakingly. With his hand still holding her little chin like a vise, the man's eyes narrowed to his further probing. Eve, he frowned, I'm not as well as I used to be. I've got pains in my arms, and they're not good pains. I shall live to be a thousand. But I, I might not. It's a rotten world, Eve, he brooded, and quite unnecessarily crowded, it seems to me, with essentially rotten people. Towards the starving and the crippled and the hideously distorted, the world, having no envy of them, shows always an amazing mercy. And beauty, whatever its sorrows, can always retreat to the thick, protecting wall of its own conceit. But as for the rest of us, he grinned with a sudden convulsive twist of the eyebrow, God help the unduly prosperous and the merely plain. From the former, always, envy like a wolf shall tear down every fresh talent, every fresh treasure they lift to their aching backs. And from the latter, brutal neglect shall ravage away even the charm that they thought they had. It's a, a rotten world, Eve, I tell you, he began all over again a bit plaintively. A rotten world, and the pains in my arms, I tell you, are not nice, distinctly not nice. Sometimes, Eve, you think I'm making faces at you, but believe me, it isn't faces that I'm making, it's my heart that I'm making at you, and believe me, the pain is not nice. Before the sudden winds in his daughter's eyes, he reverted instantly to an air of semi-jocosity. So, under all existing circumstances, little girl, he hastened to affirm, you can hardly blame a crusty old codger of a father for preferring to leave his daughter in the hands of a man whom he positively knows to be good than in the hands of some casual stranger who, just in a negative way, he merely can't prove isn't good. Oh, Eve, Eve, he pleaded sharply. You'll be so much better off, out of the world. You've got infinitely too much money and infinitely too little self-conceit to be happy here. 
They would break your heart in a year. But at Nonconono, he cried eagerly, Oh, Eve, think of the peace of it. Just white beach and a blue sea, the long, low, endless horizon. And John will make you a garden. And women, I have often heard, are very happy in a garden. And... Slowly, little Eve Edgerton lifted her eyes again to his. Has John got a beard? she asked. Why, why, I'm sure I don't remember, stammered her father. Why, yes, I think so. Why, yes, indeed, I dare say. Is it a grayish beard? asked little Eve Edgerton. Why, why, yes, I shouldn't wonder, admitted her father. And reddish? persisted little Eve Edgerton. And longish? As long as illustratively with her hands she stretched to her full arm's length yes i think perhaps it is reddish conceded her father but why oh nothing mused little eve edgerton only sometimes at night i dream about you and me landing at nonconono and john in a great big long reddish gray beard always comes crunching down at full speed across the hermit crabs to meet us and always just before he reaches us he he trips on his beard and falls headlong into the ocean and is drowned why what an awful dream deprecated her father awful queried little eve edgerton ha it makes me laugh all the same she affirmed definitely good old john elbertson will have to have his beard cut Quizzically for an instant she stared off into space, then quite abruptly she gave a quick, funny little sniff. Anyway, I'll have a garden, won't I? she said. And always, of course, there will be Henrietta. Henrietta, frowned her father. My daughter, explained little Eve Edgerton with dignity. Your daughter, snapped Edgerton. Oh, of course, there may be several, conceded little Eve Edgerton. But Henrietta, I'm almost positive, will be the best one. So jerkily she thrust her slender throat forward with a speech. Her whole facial expression seemed suddenly to have undercut and stunned her father's. Always, father, she attested grimly, with your horrid old books and specimens, you have crowded my dolls out of my steamer trunk. But never once, her tightening lips hastened to assure him, have you ever succeeded in crowding Henrietta and the others out of my mind? Quite incongruously, then, with a soft little hand in which there lurked no animosity whatsoever, she reached up suddenly and smoothed the astonishment out of her father's mouth lines. After all, father, she asked, now that we're really talking so intimately, after all, there isn't so specially much to life anyway, is there, except just the satisfaction of making the complete round of human experience once for yourself and then once again to show another person just that double chance father of getting two original glimpses at happiness one through your own eyes and one just a little bit dimmer through the eyes of another with merciless appraising vision the starving youth that was in her glared up at the satiate age in him you've had your complete round of human experience father she cried your first full untrammeled glimpse of all your heart's desires more of a glimpse perhaps than most people get from your tiniest boyhood father everything just as you wanted it just the tutors you chose in just the subjects you chose everything then that american colleges could give you everything later that european universities could offer you and then travel and more travel and more and more and then love and then fame love fame and far lands yes that's it exactly everything just as you chose it so your only tragedy father lies as far as i can see in just little me because i don't happen to be i don't happen to like the things that you like the things that you already have had the first full joy of liking you've got to miss altogether your dimmer second-hand glimpse of happiness oh i'm sorry father truly i am already i sense the hurt of these latter years the shattered expectations the incessant disappointments you who have stared unblinkingly into the face of the sun 
robbed in your twilight of even a candle flame. But, father... Grimly, despairingly, but with unfalteringly persistence, youth fighting with its last gasp for the rights of its youth, she lifted her haggard little face to his. But, father, my tragedy lies in the fact that at thirty I've never yet had even my first-hand glimpse of happiness, and now apparently, unless I'm willing to relinquish all hope of ever having it, and consent to settle down, as you call it, with good old John Albertson, I'll never even get a gamble, probably, at sighting happiness second-hand through another person's eyes. Oh, but Eve, protested her father. Nervously he jumped up and began to pace the room. One side of his face was quite grotesquely distorted, and his lean fingers, thrust precipitously into his pockets, were digging frenziedly into their own palms. Oh, but Eve, he reiterated sharply, you will be happy with John. I know you will. John is a... John is a... Underneath all that slowness, that ponderous slowness, that... that... underneath that... "'That longish, reddish, grayish beard?' interpolated little Eve Edgerton. Glaringly for an instant, the old eyes and the young eyes challenged each other, and then the dark eyes retreated suddenly before, not the strength but the weakness of their opponents. "'Oh, very well, father,' assented little Eve Edgerton. "'Only,' ruggedly, the soft little chin thrust itself forth into stubborn outline again. Only, father, she articulated with inordinate distinctness, you might just as well understand here and now, I won't budge one inch toward non canono, not one single solitary little inch toward non canono, unless at London or Lisbon or Odessa or somewhere you let me fill up all the trunks I want to with just plain pretties to take to non canono. It isn't exactly, you know, like a bride moving fifty miles out from town somewhere she explained painstakingly. When a bride goes out to a place like Nonkanono, it isn't enough, you understand, but she takes just the things she needs. What she's got to take, you see, is everything under the sun that she ever may need. With a little soft sigh of finality, she sank back into her pillows, and then struggled up for one brief instant again to add a postscript, as it were, to her ultimatum. If my day is over, without ever having been begun, she said, why, it's over without ever having been begun, and that's all there is to it. But when it comes to Henrietta, she mused, Henrietta's going to have five-inch hair ribbons and everything else from the very start. Eh? frowned Edgerton and started for the door. And, oh, father, called Eve just as his hand touched the doorknob, there's something I want to ask you for Henrietta's sake. It's rather a delicate question, but after I'm married, I suppose I shall have to save all my delicate questions to ask John, and John somehow has never seemed to me particularly canny about anything except geology. Father, she asked, just what is it that you consider so particularly obnoxious in, in young men? Is it their sins? Sins, jerked her father. Bah, it's their traits. So, questioned little Eve Edgerton from her pillows, so, such as what? Such as the pursuit of woman, snapped her father, the love not of woman, but of the pursuit of woman. On all sides you see it today, on all sides you hear it, sense it, suffer it. The young man's eternally jocose sexual appraisement of woman, is she young, is she pretty, and always eternally, is there any one younger? Is there any one prettier? Sins, you ask. Suddenly now he seemed perfectly willing, even anxious, to linger and talk. A sin is nothing, oftener than not, but a mere accidental, non-considered act. A yellow streak quite as exterior as a scorch of a sunbeam. And there is no sin existent that a man may not repent of. And there is no honest repentance, Eve, that a wise woman cannot make over into a basic foundation for happiness. But a trait, a congenital tendency, a yellow streak bred in the bone. Why, Eve, if a man loves, I tell you, not woman, but the pursuit of woman, 
so that wherever he wins he wastes again, so that indeed at last he wins only to waste, moving eternally on, 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 from one ravaged lure to another? Eve, would I deliver over you your mother's reincarnated body to, to such as that? Oh, said little Eve Edgerton. Her eyes were quite wide with horror. How careful I shall have to be with Henrietta. Eh? snapped her father. Ting-a-ling, ling, 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 trilled the telephone from the farther side of the room. Impatiently, Edgerton came back and lifted the receiver from its hook. Hello, he growled. Who? What? Eh? With quite unnecessary vehemence, he rammed the palm of his hand against the mouthpiece and glared back over his shoulder at his daughter. It's that, that Barton, he said. The impudence of him. He wants to know if you are receiving visitors today. He wants to know if he can come up. The... Yes, isn't it awful? stammered little Eve Edgerton. Imperiously, her father turned back to the telephone. Ting-a-ling, ling, 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 chirped the bell right in his face. As if he were fairly trying to bite the transmitter, he thrust his lips and teeth into the mouthpiece. My daughter, he enunciated with extreme distinctness, is feeling quite exhausted, exhausted this afternoon. We appreciate, of course, Mr. Barton, your... What? Hello there. He interrupted himself sharply. Mr. Barton? Barton! Now what in the deuce? He called back appealingly toward the bed. Why, he's rung off, the fool. Quite accidentally, then, his glance lighted on his daughter. Why, what are you smoothing your hair for? He called out accusingly. Oh, just to put it on, acknowledged little Eve Edgerton. But what in creation are you putting on your coat for? He demanded tartly. Oh, just to smooth it acknowledged the leave Edgerton. With a sniff of disgust, Edgerton turned on his heel and strode off into his own room. End of Part 1 Chapter 4 2 of Chapter 4 of Little Eve Edgerton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Eve Edgerton by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott Part 2 of Chapter 4 For five minutes by the little traveling clock she heard him pacing monotonously up and down, up and down. Then very softly at last she summoned him back to her. Father, she whispered, I think there's someone knocking at the outside door. What? called Edgerton. Incredulously, he came back through his daughter's room and, crossing over to the hall door, yanked it open abruptly on the intruder. Why, good afternoon, grinned Barton above the extravagantly large and languorous bunch of pale lavender orchids that he clutched in his hand. Good afternoon, said Edgerton without enthusiasm. Er, uh, orchids persisted Barton, still grinningly. Across the unfriendly hunch of the older man's shoulder he caught a disquieting glimpse of a girl's unduly speculative eyes. In sudden impulsive league with her against this, their apparent common enemy, age, he thrust the orchids into the older man's astonished hands. For me, questioned Edgerton icily. Why, yes, certainly, beamed Barton. Orchids, you know. Hothouse orchids, he explained painstakingly. So, I judged, admitted Edgerton. With extreme distaste, he began to untie the soft, flimsy lavender ribbon that encompassed them. In their native state, you know, he confided, one very seldom finds them growing with sashes on them. From her nest of cushions across the room, little Eve Edgerton loomed up suddenly into definite prominence. What did you bring me, Mr. Barton? she asked. Why, Eve, cried her father, why, Eve, you astonish me. Why, I'm surprised at you. Why, what do you mean? The girl sagged back into her cushions. Oh, father, she faltered, don't you know anything? That was just a small talk. With perfunctory courtesy, Edgerton returned to young Barton. 
pray be seated he said take take a chair it was the chair close to little eve edgerton that barton took how do you do miss edgerton he ventured how do you do mr barton said little eve edgerton from the splashy washstand somewhere beyond them they heard edgerton fussing with the orchids and mumbling vague latin imprecations or endearments over them a trifle surreptitiously barton smiled at eve a trifle surreptitiously eve smiled back at barton in this perfectly amiable exchange of smiles the girl reached up suddenly to the sides of her head is my is my bandage on straight she asked wordly why no admitted barton it ought not to be ought it again for no special reason whatsoever they both smiled oh i say stammered barton how you can dance across the girl's olive cheeks her heavy eyelashes shadowed down like a fringe of black ferns yes how i can dance she murmured almost inaudibly why didn't you let anybody know demanded barton yes why didn't i let anybody know repeated the girl in an utter panic of bashfulness oh i say whispered barton won't you even look at me mechanically the girl opened her eyes and stared at him fixedly until his own eyes fell eve called her father sharply from the next room where in creation is my data concerning north american orchids in my steamer trunk began the girl on the left hand side tucked in between your riding boots and my best hat oh called her father barton edged forward in his chair and touched the girl's brown boyish little hand really miss eve he stammered i'm i'm awfully sorry you got hurt truly i am truly it made me feel awfully squeamish really i've been thinking a lot about you these last few days honestly i have never in all my life did i ever carry anyone as little and hurt as you were it sort of haunts me i tell you isn't there something i could do for you something you could do for me said the leave edgerton staring then again the heavy lashes came shadowing down across her cheeks i haven't had any very great luck she said in finding you ready to do things for me what gasped barton the big eyes lifted and fell again there was the attic she whispered a bit huskily you wouldn't rent me your attic oh but i say grinned barton some real thing i mean couldn't i couldn't i read aloud to you he articulated quite distinctly as edgerton came rustling back into the room with his arms full of papers read aloud jibbed edgerton across the top of his spectacles it's a daring man in this unexpurgated day and generation who offers to read aloud to a lady he might read me my geology notes suggested little eve edgerton blandly your geology notes hooted her father what's this some more of your new-fangled small talk your geology notes still chuckling mirthlessly he strode over to the big table by the window and spreading out his orchid data over every conceivable inch of space settled himself down serenely to compare one flower of mystery with another furtively for a moment barton sat studying the gaunt graceful figure then quite impulsively he turned back to little eve edgerton's scowling face nevertheless miss eve he grinned i should be perfectly delighted to read your geology notes to you where are they here droned little eve edgerton slapping listlessly at the loose pile of pages beside her conscientiously barton reached out and gathered the flimsy papers into one trim handful where shall i begin he asked it doesn't matter murmured little eve edgerton what he said barton nervously he began to fumble through the pages is there any beginning he demanded no moped the leave edgerton nor any end he insisted nor any middle no sighed little eve edgerton helplessly barton plunged into the unhappy task before him on page nine there were perhaps the fewest blots he decided to begin there paleontologically the first sentence smote him paleontologically the periods are characterized by absence of the large marine saurians dinosaurs and pterosaurs eh gasped barton why of course 
called Edgerton a bit impatiently from the window. Laboriously, Barton went back and reread the phrase to himself. Oh, oh, yes, he conceded lamely. Paleontologically, he began all over again. Oh, dear, no, he interrupted himself. I was farther along than that. Absence of marine saurians, oh, yes. Absence of marine saurians, he resumed glibly. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs, so abundant in the, in the Cretaceous of Ammonites and Belemnites, he persisted heroically. Hesitatingly, stumblingly, without a glimmer of understanding, his bewildered mind worried on and on, its entire mental energy concentrated on the single purpose of trying to pronounce the awful words. Of rudists, Enocerami, Tri, Trigonias, the horrible paragraph tortured on, by the marked reduction in the brachiopods compared with the now richly developed gastropods and and sinupaliate uh, lamelli branches, it writhed and twisted before his dizzy eyes. Every sentence was a struggle. More than one of the words he was forced to spell aloud just out of sheer self-defense and always against Eve Edgerton's little intermittent nod of encouragement, was balanced that hateful sniffing sound of surprise and contempt from the orchid table in the window. Despairingly he skipped a few lines to the next unfamiliar words that met his eye. The Neozoic flora, he read, consists mainly of, of angio, angiosper, Still smiling, but distinctly wan around the edges of the smile, he slammed the handful of papers down on his knees. "'If it really doesn't make any difference where we begin, Miss Eve,' he said, "'for heaven's sake, let's begin somewhere else.' "'Oh, all right,' crooned little Eve Edgerton. Expeditiously, Barton turned to another page, and another. Wryly, he tasted strange sentence after strange sentence. Then suddenly his whole wonderful face wreathed itself in smiles again. Three superfamilies of turtles, he began joyously. Turtles, ha, I know turtles, he proceeded with real triumph. Why, that's the first word I've recognized in all this, this, er, uh, this what I've been reading. Sure I know turtles, he reiterated with increasing conviction. Why, sure, those, those slow-crawling, box-like affairs that live in the mud and are used for soup and, uh, er, uh, combs, he continued blithely. The very same, nodded little Eve Edgerton soberly. Oh, lordy, groaned her father from the window. Oh, this is going to be lots better, beamed Barton, now that I know what it's all about. For goodness sake, growled Edgerton from his table, how do you people think I'm going to do any work with all this jabbering going on? Hesitatingly for a moment, Barton glanced back over his shoulder at Edgerton, and then turned around again to probe Eve's preferences in the matter. As sluggishly determinate as two black turtles trailing along a white sand beach, her great dark eyes in her little pale face seemed headed suddenly toward some faraway idea. Oh, go right on reading, Mr. Barton, nodded little Eve Edgerton. Three superfamilies of turtles, began Barton all over again. Three superfamilies of turtles, the... the... Amphichilidia, the Cryptodira, and the Tri, the Tri, the T R I O N Y C H O I D E A, he spelled out laboriously. With a vicious jerk of his chair, Edgerton snatched up his papers and his orchids and started for the door. When you people get all through this nonsense, he announced, maybe you'll be kind enough to let me know. I shall be in the writing room. With satirical courtesy he bowed first to Eve, then to Barton, dallied an instant on the threshold to repeat both vows, and went out, slamming the door behind him. "'A nervous man, isn't he?' suggested Barton. Bravely, little Eve Edgerton considered thought. Trionochiodia. She prompted quite irrelevantly. "'Oh, yes, of course,' conceded Barton. But do you mind if I smoke? 
"'No, I don't mind if you smoke,' sing-songed the girl. With a palpable sigh of relief, Barton lighted a cigarette. "'You're nice,' he said. "'I like you.' Conscientiously, then, he resumed his reading. "'No pleurodera have yet been found,' he began. "'Yes, isn't that too bad?' sighed little Eve Edgerton. "'It doesn't matter personally to me,' admitted Barton. Hastily, he moved on to the next sentence. "'The Amphichilidea are known there by only the genus Baina,' he read. Two described species, B. Undata and B. Arenosa, to which was added B. Herbrachia and B. Ponderosa. Petulantly, he slammed the whole handful of papers to the floor. "'Eve,' he stammered, "'I can't stand it. I tell you, I just can't stand it. Take my attic if you want to, or my cellar, or my garage, or anything else of mine in the world that you have any fancy for. But for heaven's sake!' With extraordinarily dilated eyes, Eve Edgerton stared out at him from her white pillows. "'Why? Why, if it makes you feel like that, just to read it?' she reproached him mournfully. "'How do you suppose it makes me feel to have to write it?' "'All you have to do is to read it,' she said. "'But I, I have to write it.' "'But why do you have to write it?' gasped Barton. Languidly, her heavy lashes shadowed down across her cheeks again. "'It's for the British consul at Nankonono,' she said. "'It's some notes he asked me to make for him in London this last spring.' "'But for mercy's sake, do you like to write things like that?' insisted Barton. "'Oh, no,' drawled little Eve Edgerton. "'But, of course, if I marry him,' she confided without the slightest flicker of emotion. "'It's what I'll have to write all the rest of my life.' "'But,' stammered Barton, "'for mercy's sake, do you want to marry him?' he asked quite bluntly. "'Oh, no,' drawled little Eve Edgerton. Impatiently, Barton threw away his half-smoked cigarette and lighted a fresh one. "'Then why?' he demanded." "'Oh, it's something father invented,' said little Eve Edgerton. Altogether emphatically, Barton pushed back his chair. "'Well, I call it a shame,' he said, "'for a nice life little girl like you to be packed off like so much baggage "'to marry some great grey-bearded clout who hasn't got an idea in his head except—' except, "'Squintingly, he stared down at the scattered sheets on the floor. "'Except Amphichelidia,' he asserted with some feeling. "'Yes, isn't it?' sighed little Eve Edgerton. "'For heaven's sake,' said Barton, "'where is Nankonono?' "'Nankonono?' whispered little Eve Edgerton. "'Where is it? Why, it's an island, in an ocean, you know, rather a hot green island, in rather a hot blue-green ocean. Lots of green palms, you know, and rank rough green grass, and green bugs, and green butterflies, and green snakes.' and a great crawling, crunching collar of white sand and hermit crabs all around it. And then just a long, unbroken line of turquoise-colored waves, and then more turquoise-colored waves, and then more turquoise-colored waves, and then more turquoise-colored waves, and then, and then, and then what? worried Barton. With a vaguely astonished lift of the eyebrows, little Eve Edgerton met both question and questioner perfectly squarely. "'Why, then, more turquoise-colored waves, of course,' chanted Lily Edgerton. "'It sounds rotten to me,' confided Barton. "'It is,' said Lily Edgerton. "'And, oh, I forgot to tell you, John Elbertson is sort of green, too. "'Geologists are up to be, don't you think so?' "'I never saw one,' admitted Barton without shame. "'If you'd like me to,' said Eve, "'I'll show you how the turquoise-colored waves sound "'when they strike the hermit crabs.' "'Do,' urged Barton. "'Listlessly, the girl pushed back into her pillow, "'slid down a little farther into her blankets, "'and closed her eyes. "'Mmm,' she began. "'Mmm, wish, After a while, of course, I think you might stop, suggested Barton a bit creepishly. Again, the big eyes opened at him with distinct surprise. Why, why, said Eve Edgerton, it never stops. 
"'Oh, I say,' frowned Barton, "'I do feel awfully badly about your going off to a place like that to leave. "'Really,' he stammered. "'We're going Thursday,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'Thursday!' cried Barton. For some inexplainable reason the whole idea struck him suddenly as offensive, distinctly offensive, as if fate, the impatient waiter, had snatched away a yet untasted plate. "'Why, why, Eve,' he protested, "'why, we're only just beginning to get acquainted.' "'Yes, I know it,' mused the Eve Edgerton. "'Why, if we'd have had half a chance,' began Barton, and then didn't know at all how to finish it. "'Why, you're so plucky, and so odd, and so interesting,' he began all over again. "'Oh, of course I'm an awful duffer and all that. "'But if we'd had half a chance, I say, "'you and I would have been great pals in another fortnight.' "'Even so,' murmured little Eve Edgerton, "'there are yet fifty-two hours before I go.' "'What are fifty-two hours?' laughed Barton. Listlessly, like a wilting flower, little Eve Edgerton slid down a trifle farther into her pillows. "'If you'd have an early supper,' she whispered. "'And then, come right up here afterward, why, there would be two or three hours. And then tomorrow, if you get up quite early, there would be a long, long morning. And we could get acquainted some,' she insisted. "'Why, Eve,' said Barton, "'do you really mean that you would like to be friends with me?' "'Yes, I do.' nodded the crown of the white bandaged head but i'm so stupid confided barton with astonishing humility all these botany things and geology and yes i know it mumbled little eve edgerton that's what makes you so restful what queried barton a bit sharply then very absent-mindedly for a moment he sat staring off into space through a gray pungent haze of cigarette smoke eve he ventured at last. What? mumbled little Eve Edgerton. Nothing, said Barton. Mr. Jim Barton, ventured Eve. What? asked Barton. Nothing, mumbled little Eve Edgerton. Out of some emotional or purely social tensities of life, it seems rather that time strikes the clock than that anything so small as a clock should dare strike the time. One, two, three four five winced the poor little frightened travelling clock on the mantelpiece then quite abruptly little eve edgerton emerged from her cosy cushions sitting bolt upright like a doughty little warrior mr jim barton said little eve edgerton if i stayed here two weeks longer i know you'd like me i know it i just know it quizzically for an instant as if to accumulate further courage she cocked her little head on one side and stared blankly into Barton's astonished eyes. But you see, I'm not going to be here two weeks, she resumed hurriedly. Again the little head cocked appealingly to one side. You, you wouldn't be willing to take my word for it, would you? And like me now? Why, why, what do you mean? stammered Barton. What do I mean? quizzed little Eve Edgerton. Why, I mean that just once before I go off to Nonconono, I'd like to be attractive. Attractive, stammered Bart helplessly. With all the desperate, indomitable frankness of a child, the girl's chin thrust itself forward. I could be attractive, she said. I know. I could. I know I could. If I'd ever let go just the teeniest, tiniest bit, I could have bows, she asserted triumphantly. A thousand bows, she added more explicitly. Only... "'Only what?' laughed Barton. "'Only one doesn't let go,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'Why not?' persisted Barton. "'Why, you just couldn't with strangers,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'That's the bewitchment of it.' "'The bewitchment?' puzzled Barton. "'Nervously the girl crossed her hands in her lap. "'She suddenly didn't look like a doughty little soldier any more, "'but just like a worried little girl.' "'Did you ever read any fairy stories?' she asked, with apparent irrelevance. "'Why, of course,' said Barton, "'millions of them when I was a kid.' "'I read one once,' said little Eve Edgerton. "'It was about a person, a sleeping person, a lady, I mean, "'who couldn't wake up until a prince kissed her. "'Well, that was all right, of course,' conceded little Eve Edgerton, "'because—' 
Of course any prince would have been willing to kiss the lady just as a mere matter of accommodation. But suppose, fretted little Eve Edgerton, suppose the bewitchment also ran that no prince would kiss the lady until she had waked up. Now there, said little Eve Edgerton, is a situation that I should call completely stalled. But what's all this got to do with you? grinned Barton. Nothing at all to do with me, said little Eve Edgerton. It is me. That's just exactly the way I'm fixed. I can't be attractive out loud until someone likes me. But no one, of course, will ever like me until I'm already attractive out loud. So that's why I wondered, she said, if just as a mere matter of accommodation, you wouldn't be willing to be friends with me now. So that for at least the fifty-two hours that remain, I could be released from my most unhappy enchantment. Astonishingly, across that frank, perfectly outspoken little face, the frightened eyelashes came flickering suddenly down. Because, she whispered little Eve Edgerton, because, you see, I happen to like you already. Oh, fine, smiled Barton. Fine, fine. Abruptly, the word broke in his throat. What? he cried. His hand, the steadiest hand among all his chums, began to shake like an aspen. What? he cried. His heart, the steadiest heart among all his chums, began to pitch and lurch in his breast. Why, Eve! Eve! he stammered. You don't mean you like me like that? Yes, I do, nodded the little white-capped head. There was much shyness of flesh in the statement, but not a flicker of spiritual self-consciousness or fear. But, Eve, protested Barton. Already he felt the goose flesh rising on his arms. Once before a girl had told him that she liked him. In the middle of a silly summer flirtation it had been. And the scene had been mawkish, awful, a mess of tears and kisses and endless recriminations. But this girl? Before the utter simplicity of this girl's statement, the unruffled dignity, the mere acknowledgment, as it were, of an interesting historical fact. All his trifling, preconceived ideas went tumbling down before his eyes like a flimsy house of cards. Pang after pang of regret for the girl, of regret for himself, went surging hotly through him. Oh, but Eve, he began all over again, his voice raw with misery. Why, there's nothing to make a fuss about, drawled little Eve Edgerton. You've probably liked a thousand people. But I, you see, I've never had the fun of liking anyone before. Fun, tortured Barton. Yes, that's just it. If you'd ever had the fun of liking anything, it wouldn't seem half so brutal. Now, brutal, mused little Eve Edgerton. Oh, really, Mr. Jim Barton, I assure you, there's nothing brutal at all in my liking for you. With a gasp of despair, Barton stumbled across the rug to the bed, and with a shaky hand thrust under Eve Edgerton's chin, turned her little face bluntly up to him to tell her how proud he felt, but to tell her how sorry he was, but... And as he turned that little face up to his, inconceivably, incomprehensively, to his utter consternation and rout, he saw that it was a stranger's little face that he held. Gone was the sullen frown, the indifferent glance, the bitter smile, and in that sudden amazing wild sweet transfiguration of brow, eyes, mouth that met his astonished eyes, he felt his whole mean, supercilious world slip out from under his feet. And just as precipitously, just as inexplainably, as ten days before he had seen a great light that had knocked all consciousness out of him, he experienced now a second great light that knocked him back into the first full consciousness that he had ever known. Why, Eve, he stammered, why... You mischief! Why, you little cheeky darling! Why, my own darn little storybook girl! And gathered her into his arms. From the farther side of the room, the sound of a creaking board smote almost instantly upon their ears. Any time that you people want me, suggested Edgerton's icy voice, I am standing here, in about the middle of the floor. With a jerk of dismay, Barton wheeled around to face him. But it was Lily Edgerton herself who found her tongue first. Oh, father, dear, I have been perfectly wise, she hastened to assure him. 
almost at once father i told him that i liked him so that if he really were the dreadful kind of young man you were warning me about he would eliminate himself from my horizon immediately in his wicked pursuit of some other lady oh he did run father she confessed in the first red blush of her life oh he did run father but it was almost directly toward me eh snapped edgerton then in a defiant effrontery half impudence and half humility barton stepped out into the middle of the room and proffered his strong firm young hand to the older man you told me he grinned to rummage around until i discovered a real treasure well i didn't have to do it it was the treasure it seems who discovered me then suddenly into his fine young eyes flared up the first glint of his newborn soul your daughter sir said barton is the most beautiful woman in the world as you suggested to me i have found out what she is interested in she is interested in me end of part two chapter four end of little eve edgerton